So we're going to go over some recipes and how to put this into action so you know more about, you know, recipes. I use every, my favorite recipes, recipes that you can use over and over again. And some of the, we'll do some like magic cooking where we're actually putting the recipe together so when you know how to make certain things, you know exactly how to do this. General guidelines, you know I'm stressing green vegetables, particularly raw vegetables. For example, at our retreat, we serve lunch on a salad bar every day, and everybody gets a big bowl, like a serving bowl, and you try to fill up your salad with all those vegetables. And I want your lunch, I want you to really kind of get in a pattern of making your lunch the same every day. Because the lunch is the main meal of the day, where you're having that big salad in a nine-inch salad bowl. And what you put in that salad is very important. So you fill up the salad bowl like half filled with lettuce, chopped lettuce, and then you put a handful of some cruciferous on it, like arugula, watercress, bok choy, cabbage, baby kale, some kind of cruciferous mixed in. You can add some spinach, but as I said yesterday, the spinach shouldn't be more than 25% of your total green leafy vegetables because it's higher in oxalic acid, and the oxalic acid binds calcium, so making the calcium not available from spinach like it is, even though it has calcium in it, it doesn't go into your body as easy as from the other vegetables. So we don't use a predominantly spinach salad. And then you put scallion and red onion on top too. Then you can add whatever you want, tomatoes, beans, edamame, you know, chopped Brussels sprouts, whatever you want, roasted red pepper, cooked mushrooms, with your salad dressing. And because that salad, that having that daily salad that you chew very well, that you chew to your liqu liquefy it in your mouth with a dressing made from nuts and seeds. We're going to go over some of those dressings today because since the salad is the most important thing you eat the whole day, then the, one of the most important recipes are different salad dressings that you love to make the salad taste great. Like my favorite salad dressing that I use most often is very simple. It's just two peeled navel oranges or another type of orange, like a blood orange, blended with a mixture of cashews and hemp seeds or cashews and sesame seeds. And I take the sesame seeds and I bring out, I heighten their flavor by toasting them for two minutes on a flat pan, a flat dry pan, just so they start to smoke off a little touch to en enhance their flavor. I take half of the sesame seeds, then the, and then I'm going to put in the salad dressing, and I might put in, let's say, you know, a quarter of a cup of sesame seeds in the flat pan that I'm toasting. The cashews, I'm just putting the, um, you know, a quarter of a cup of cashews in the, in the blender with the orange and with maybe a little squeeze of lemon and a little splash of blood orange vinegar. That's the secret ingredient to that. My favorite dressing is the blood orange vinegar. Then I take half the toasted sesame seeds and I put that in the blender and cream it down for the dressing. And the other half I leave to sprinkle on top of the salad. And maybe I'll put pomegranate arils or little mandarin orange slices or kiwi slices in with the tomatoes. I'll put a little fruit on that salad and I'll make this fruity salad that I love with the orange um, sesame dressing on top. One of my typical dressings. I even like it better when, I, when, I, when I'm making a salad with a dressing like that. I'm going to always make more than I can eat. So I have like the leftovers for the next day. And I personally like it when, it, when I can save the salad bowl, put what's left over into a, like a plastic container in the refrigerator for the next day and compact it down in that container. It gets a little softer and more soggy the next day. But I like eating it a little, like the kale and the cabbage and the bok choy gets a little softer and more soggy with the dressing kind of soaks in a little more. I like, I like it that way too. Some people don't. But we'll go over some of those salad dressings today, even though I just went over one, because it says right there that you're going to eat raw vegetables, a pound of raw vegetables, which is, it seems like a lot, overwhelming, but it's not that much, because think about it, a tomato, one tomato could weigh half a pound, one carrot and the tomato both could be a pound. Bring a raw broccoli, you know, you're eating at least six ounces alone of um, six to eight ounces of leafy greens, and you put the tomato on top and the other things we're putting on top of the salad, you're certainly, it's not that... You are probably eating, you know, at least a half a pound or maybe three quarters of a pound of raw vegetables. 
for lunch, and then you're having some raw vegetables with your dinner too. And those are more the solid raw vegetables. And then cooked vegetables, a pound of cooked vegetables seems like a lot, but it's not that much. One box of frozen broccoli is like 10 ounces. That's only, that's, you know, more than half a pound right there. I knew, I, 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 I figured this out, the pound of cooked vegetables, because I knew when my daughter was four years old, she used to bring a box of frozen broccoli to nurse, to preschool with her every day. I figured, so I figured if a four-year-old could eat 10 ounces of frozen broccoli, a day, a fish for lunch, then why can't an adult eat that much? <laughs> but the point also is if you don't eat a pound of raw vegetables and a pound of cooked vegetables, you're not, to you're not gonna be satisfied with what you're eating and you're gonna eat other things that are, more, that, are, that are not as healthy. So it's really important to try to go for the pound of raw vegetables and the pound of cooked vegetables each day. And then beans at least a half a cup a day. And I'm usually serving a bowl of vegetable bean soup with lunch. And some of those beans are in that soup. And then maybe so I'll put some beans mixed with the salad and, and with the vegetable dish at night too. And it, it's better, it's actually better to have like part of your beans with your lunch and part of your beans with your dinner as opposed to eating the whole cup at one time. So I might have a bean burger or a bean or, you know, a tempeh slices, pistachio crusted tempeh or some kind of bean dish. But there's usually beans in the soup. And as you know, because the mushrooms we want you to eat every day we want you to have at least two varieties of mushroom a day. That means I usually buy shiitake mushrooms because those are the kind that are more chewy and meaty and they really work well in soups and stews. And then I always get one other type of mushroom to mix in with the shiitake. And I make that other type a different type most days. It could be the more inexpensive white button or cremini mushroom or it could be a more expensive mushroom like trumpet oyster lion's mane or one of those other mushrooms and even though they're really expensive it might you know because the regular mushrooms might be five dollars a pound but these expensive the exotic mushrooms might be twelve dollars a pound but it's it's not that bad because you're not getting because they're so lightweight that you that even um a half a pound of mushrooms could last you for a few days it's not that much you know it's worth getting and they're such powerful anti-cancer foods which we're going to talk about that later so we put those different types of mushrooms in the soup or you, or you have mushrooms mixed with your vegetables, maybe a, a mushroom sauce, or you put mushroom, you're cooking a wok. Maybe it will do, we're talking about a Thai wok today where you're going to put mushrooms and onions and snow pea pods and water chestnuts and, and um, shredded savoy cabbage, and you're going to make a, a wok. You'll throw some mushrooms in there too. So we'll utilize those different types of mushrooms, and probably, I'm saying, use both types of mushrooms in the dish. So it adds just different textures and flavors, and they soak up the sauce differently. So you have your beans split between two meals, you know, at least half a cup a day. And then we're striving for the nuts and seeds for the sauces and for the dressings, and we're trying to go for about a half an ounce with each meal of nuts and seeds. If, you have, if you're overweight, you're doing a half an ounce. I, don't, I do more than that. I go for about an ounce of nuts and seeds with each meal because I'm trying to, because um, I do a lot of exercise. And I, I, want, I need the extra calories. But most people, because they're not as active, may be going for a half an ounce of nuts and seeds with each meal. So that means that breakfast is usually when you're getting in your flax seeds, your chia seeds, and your hemp seeds. So breakfast is usually a cup of fruit. It could be a cup of berries or a low-sugar fruit like pomegranate or a wild low sugar fruit like passion fruit or guava or loquats or kumquats, or some kind of low sugar fruit of a cup. And then one other fruit that could be any other fruit you want that's not low, low in sugar with that. And then you're having some grain usually with breakfast that might be a small amount, even like three tablespoons of oats or, or quinoa or millet or, you know, or some kind of or kamut just a little bit of grain, because you don't want to use too much grain because we want to have room to have some of the flax seeds and the chia seeds and the hemp seeds with your breakfast to get that half an ounce in. I'm having probably a tablespoon of flax, a tablespoon of chia, and a tablespoon of hemp. I'm having personally three tablespoons on top of my grain, and then I put on that some walnut hemp milk or some soy milk. For some of our people that are looking to lose weight, they put on mostly unsweetened soy milk with a little, you know, with, their, with about a teaspoon of the hemp seeds, a teaspoon of the chia seeds, and a teaspoon of the flax seeds on their 
little grain and cup of berries. And then they don't they use more of the soy milk as opposed to I'm using my walnut hemp milk that we homemade. We made the homemade milk, it was very easy to make. We use one cup of seeds, and that one cup of seeds and nuts is half hemp seeds and half walnuts. And the hemp seeds and walnuts are the high omega-3. The walnut is, has the most omega-3 of all nuts. And hemp seeds are high in protein and have a lot of omega-3. So we're trying as much as possible to include the omega-3 nuts and seeds in the recipes. In other words, if a recipe calls for cashew nuts, then I modify that recipe by taking about a third of the cashews away and substituting hemp seeds for it. Because you can mix it together and it will taste just like the cashews anyway, but it'll improve the omega-3, omega-6 balance of that recipe or the meal because I used more hemp seeds instead of cashews. If I'm making pistachio crusted tempeh or making some other using pecans or almonds, I'm always going to take part of that nut out and put some hemp seeds or walnut in to give it a more a better balance because I want to have walnuts and hemp seeds, flax and chia, the high omega-3 nuts, be at least a, a third to a half of my total nut intake of the day. So in this case, I made that drink out of walnuts and hemp seeds. I took the cup of walnuts and, and hemp seeds mixed together. I mixed them together. It's half, fill up half the cup with hemp seeds, and then the rest of the cup fill up and crush the walnuts down. I'm putting a cup of nuts and seeds in the blender, and now I'm putting in six cups of water on top of that. So one cup of nuts and seeds, six cups of water, and to your liking, you can add one medjool date or two medjool dates to sweeten it a touch, because you're having six cups of water in there. That's good for like, that's six servings of milk or more, I mean, even eight servings of milk. So you blend that down, and I usually will add a heaping teaspoon, one heaping teaspoon of real vanilla bean powder. And that's one of the secret ingredients we use a lot in our cooking, the real vanilla bean powder, which has anti-cancer effects in the vanilla and the linen. And the, so you don't, you don't get the beneficial health effects from vanilla extract and vanilla flavoring and vanilla powder. We're talking about real ground vanilla bean. And the problem with it is it's very expensive and hard to find. We bought some batches in like a 500-pound barrels at, at doctor, in my office in New Jersey and we keep it in the refrigerator. And we've had it packed for us in little bags. So we are selling it on the website because we're selling it on the website because one, people can't find organic vanilla bean powder so available in their neighborhoods or on, even on the web. And number two, when they do find it, it's so incredibly expensive, like $300 or $400 a pound. So we just got it and bring it out for people at a lower price to make it not so prohibitively expensive and have the high quality vanilla bean powder available for the recipes, even though it is still super expensive. I think it's probably like, I don't even know what it costs, you know, a couple of hundred dollars for a little bag of it. But, but um, in any case, you're only using a teaspoon. So you're drinking a glass of walnut. It's about a, a $40 glass of soy milk. <laughs> no, just kidding. Not quite that much. Thirty-nine dollars. 